it and this is concept four on solutions and this is just for the honor students because this is something that I think is really important to start understanding now um, just a little bit more background for you a little bit more in depth especially um, for going into chemistry um, so we're gonna spend a little bit of time in solutions so Hopefully you remember from concept one when we talked about classifying matter that solutions are homogeneous mixtures. They have the same composition, color, density, and taste throughout. And then in concept two, I gave you a little bit more information on them. And I told you there's two parts to a solution. There's the solute and the solvent. Solute is the substance being dissolved and solvent is the substance doing the dissolving. So in lemonade, as a solution, the solute's the powder and the solvent is the water. Again, from a molecular standpoint, as you can see, it's kind of evenly dispersed throughout. Now, something I want to touch on that I mentioned in, um, I believe it was concept two, maybe concept one, solutions don't have to always be solids dissolved in liquids. I think that's what we traditionally think, like a powder dissolved in um, like water or something like that. But there are some other ways that solutions can exist. They can be any sort. Um, for instance, a gas dissolved in a gas is like air. It's oxygen basically dissolved in nitrogen. Um, a solution of a gas in a liquid is soda, carbon dioxide in water and sugar and some other things, but that's in general what it is. Or um, a liquid in a liquid, like rubbing alcohol, it's water, it's a solution of water in alcohol. Um, and then what I think is really interesting too is solutions could even be solids in solids. Um, and that's called an alloy. It's a solution of metals dissolved in other metals. And in order to make an alloy, you do have to melt them down to their liquid state mix them then, and then allow it to solidify again. But that's how you would create an alloy. And a couple of examples are bronze is a solution of copper and zinc. Um, brass, like um, this instrument, is a solution of copper and tin. And then sterling silver, it's an, a solution of copper and silver. If you've ever had, girls ever had any jewelry, and you've had it for a really long time, and it starts to turn like that copper color, that's because that that silver on the outside has basically been wearing off over time. Um, it starts turning your finger green, so you know it's sterling silver, not just pure silver. So, another little reminder, we mentioned this in concept two about physical properties, but solubility. It's the maximum amount of solute that can dissolve in a certain amount of solvent at a given temperature. So I think I gave you a simpler um, definition just to introduce it in concept two, but this is the definition I really um, want you to know. I think the simpler definition I gave you is just a substance's ability to dissolve something, but um, definitely make sure you know this more um, detailed one. And solubility really depends on a lot of things. It depends on the nature of the solute, the nature of the solvent, and then also the temperature of the solution. And so we're going to talk through three types of solution um, based on solubility. So because of solubility, we can get three types of solutions. We can have unsaturated, saturated, or super saturated solutions. So hopefully the pictures are giving you a little hint on what the differences are. So an unsaturated solution is a solution that's able to dissolve more solute at the given temperature. It's not at its maximum capacity. So let's say... Um, water can hold, you know, 10 grams of lemonade powder. It can dissolve 10 grams of lemonade powder. That would be its solubility at room temperature, let's say. An unsaturated solution would be like if you only had 2 grams of lemonade powder in your water. You could still add more um, solute and dissolve it in the, in the solvent. Now, if we heat it, if we get it to a higher temperature, a solution will always become more unsaturated. You can always add more solute at um, higher temperatures, so that's something to think about too. A saturated solution is where you the it contains all of the solute it can hold at the given temperature. It's at its maximum capacity. So with that lemonade example, if room temperature water, if its maximum um, solubility is 10 grams, a saturated solution would be 10 grams of that powder dissolved in the water. The only way we could um, 
change this is again if we raise the temperature that would make it unsaturated and we could add more to get it to be saturated and then last is super saturated this is when a solution contains more solute than it can hold so it's above its maximum capacity so that extra solute doesn't dissolve it just collects at the bottom you may have experienced this if you like really sweet tea and you've gotten like cold unsweet tea and you try to add sugar to it and you've um you've added some and you keep adding it and it just starts collecting at the bottom of your cup it's not really mixing in that's because it's super saturated you've already added too much so again for my room temperature water and um, if the solubility is 10 grams of solute, which would be like the lemonade powder, if I add 12 grams, 2 grams of that should not dissolve and they would just sit at the bottom. And that would be because of the, it's super saturated. Chemically speaking, these are considered unstable when they're super saturated. And the, the skill that I really want you all to grasp with um, understanding um, solubility is understanding a solubility curve. It's really important that you can look at one of these graphs and answer questions about them. So a solubility curve basically just shows the amount of solute um, a solvent can hold at a bunch of different temperatures. So let's kind of break this down. What are we looking at here? And then we'll do some practice with this in class. But um, so first notice the axes and their labels. Um, down here on the x-axis, we have temperature, and it's showing degrees Celsius. So we're looking, how does the solubility change as temperature increases? Because this is solubility, and look at the units. It's grams per 100 grams of water. So this number is telling me how many grams of solute am I dissolving in 100 grams of water. All right, and then notice our key. All right, in our key, each line is a different color, and it's actually representing a different um, substance, a different compound. So what you can see is that this is showing the solubility of four different compounds and how their solubilities change over with change of temperature. So we have the yellow lines, potassium nitrate, the blue line, sodium chlorate, pink lines, potassium bromide, and the green line is sodium chloride. So some questions we could ask. You know, at what temperature does or do potassium nitrate and potassium bromide have the same solubility? So if I want to know, okay, potassium nitrate, that's my yellow line, potassium bromide, that's my pink line, when do they have the same solubility? Well, that's when they would crisscross. And notice they both would have a solubility of about maybe 70 grams, and that is at a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius. Another question could be, um, okay, what would be, at what temperature would the solubility of sodium chlorate be 200 grams? So sodium chlorate is my blue line. So go over to 200 grams and then go over to the blue line and it can hold 200 grams at 100 degrees Celsius. Um, another question, how much, kind of thinking the other direction, how much solute could potassium bromide hold at 10 degrees Celsius? So potassium bromide is my pink line. We go to 10 degrees Celsius, go up until you hit the pink line and then go over it's right between 40 and 80, so it would be 60 grams. It could hold 60 grams of potassium bromide in 100 grams of water. That's its solubility at 10 degrees Celsius. And then the only other type of question um, maybe would be like, what type of solution would we say sodium chlorate is if 120 grams of it are dissolved at 30 degrees Celsius? So sodium chlorate is my blue line. So 30 degrees Celsius, let's see how much can it hold at 30 degrees Celsius. So go to 30 degrees Celsius, go up to my blue line. It can hold 100 grams, it's right between 80 and 120. It can hold 100 grams of solute and 100 grams of water. So if it, this is saying that I've dissolved 120 grams, that's more than it can hold. So that means this must be a super saturated solution. Those are the types of questions that I would ask you about a solubility curve. And again, we're going to practice this in class, so don't worry. All right, how does this dissolving work? How does it work to dissolve um, a solute in a solvent? What's chemically going, what's going on here from a molecular standpoint? So not all types of matter dissolve super easily. Um, one thing that's important to note is water is super special and it has a lot of unique properties that we're gonna get into a lot more in biology, but one of those being it's a really, really, really good solvent because it's polar. 
and polar means it has oppositely charged in. So overall, water has a neutral charge of zero, but the oxygen side of water in the H2O is a little bit negative, and then the hydrogen side is a little bit positive, and so that gives it this polarity. And pol that means polar solutes, like ionic compounds, which is like salts, like sodium chloride. We're going to learn a lot about them in our bonding unit. But they dissolve really well in water because they are polar also. And so there's this opposite charge attraction going on that um, pulls them apart and dissolves it. So like sodium chloride is NaCl. There's positive sodium ions and negative chlorine ions. But together, it's overall neutral. So all of these little blue dots are sodium and they're positive and all the green ones are chlorine and they're negative. And so water, these positive hydrogens are going to attract to these negative chlorine ions, and then the negative oxygen is going to attract to the positive sodium ions, and that's going to make it possible to dissolve. And so we call this dissociation. It's a process in which ionic compounds, which are salts, crystals, that kind of thing, they separate out into their separate ions, and it's usually very reversible. So what's happening? Positive ends of water, the hydrogens, attract to the negative ions of the salt. The negative ends of the water attract to the positive ions of the salt. There's an attractive force then because of these opposite charges that pulls the ions away from the crystal. And then the water molecules surround the ions and it keeps going until all the ions are separated. And so I have a really good animation to show you that will help you understand this a little bit better. But it's going to show you how we get solutions like this. Like how do they dissolve? How does this dissociation occur? And so we're going to watch that in class. The last thing I want to mention is factors that affect the rate of dissolving. And there's kind of three things we'll see. So one is smaller solute size. The smaller the solute, the faster um, the dissolving can occur because there's going to be more surface area on each particle so the solvent has basically more places that it can come into contact with the solute and thus dissolve it. Heating the solvent also um, increases the rate. It makes it happen faster because think, higher temperature, more kinetic energy the particles, they're going to collide more which is going to make it, there be more contact so they're going to dissolve faster. And then last is stirring the solution. That'll increase the rate and make it faster as well. Because basically, stirring brings fresh solvent into contact with solute that hasn't been dissolved yet. And so that, um, that kind of promotes the dissolving process. All right, and that is solutions.